and Roy would have felt that this was not going to come about through a political, uh, just political reasoning alone. That's, they, they were pretty much of the view that this would come to a military conflict. Mm. They had local sympathizers and it showed them how to defeat the system. But the new man can't step into the dead man's shoes and his knowledge at blinding the cyclops, blinding the, the giant. Well, I think Michael Collins was a, was a great pragmatist. Um, he knew his history and he knew back over the centuries that a lot of Irish rebellions and uh, 1798 and so on failed because the British often had spies and farmers within the Irish ranks. Mm. And um, Michael Collins recognised the importance of intelligence and information and um, he was a, a genius when it came to gathering intelligence and he's literally hundreds of people working for him within all aspects of the British administration and even on the railways and docks and all of that. Mm. And then it's one thing to uh, compile all that information and through that of course he knew then who the key detectives were and all of that the, from G Division of the Dublin Metropolitan Police. And then um, he set out to blind and deafen the British um, intelligence system basically. Mm. And to do that you have to his reckoning was there's another way out of it only to shoot people he had to undermine the yeah. uh, intelligence source yeah. that was the whole key yeah. it was the same sort of argument he had uh, he, there's a reference to the book where he may have got uh, the hiding in plain sight which you refer yes, to there yes. you know the, if you're uh, brazen and uh, go up to somebody you can't be who people may think you are yeah. because you wouldn't do that if you were and yeah. that sort of thing
he, he was, you know, he was uh, given to uh, moments of bravura. During the summer of 1919, Michael Collins' sister, Katie Sheridan, came from Mayo to Dublin to visit her brother. An informer recognised her boarding the train and her description was wired to Dublin. The police and military were waiting for a woman wearing a brown gabardine coat. Katie had met a friend who was worried by her poor appearance as she'd been feeling ill. His sister, who was on the train, was got quite ill. She insisted that Katie should take her fur coat and wrap up well due to the bad weather. And there was a coat exchanged and the friend gave her the fur coat. As the train had reached the station, the platform was swarming with troops. He, he, Michael Collins appeared to be delaying the trains. Yeah. They were looking for him and the soldiers were coming in. Passengers were told to remain seated as the British began to search the train. Katie had evaded detection due to the swap of the coats. She had some shock when she saw Michael Collins and Joe O'Reilly. Michael Collins had ran up to her. Collins had asked a porter what all the fuss was about. The porter had said that the arrest of Michael Collins was imminent. He was creating mischief. You know, he, he was actually so bold, he'd go up and question the soldiers. Collins made for the nearest British officer and blustered. That damn Collins again. This is the third time today I've been held up on that damn blackguard's account. He also pointed to Katie. Look at that poor lady. She's obviously very unwell. What use can there be in detaining her? The officer had seen that the fur coat did not match the description and he nodded and let her go. Michael Collins thanked the British soldier, shepherded poor Kate through the mass of soldiers, muttering about that damned Collins. And she got away. Well, one of the most unusual aspects of Michael Collins' uh, <coughs> father and mother's marriage was the fact that on their wedding day in 1876, Michael's uh, mother was 23, which mm. was a normal age enough to get married, I suppose, but his father was 60. Mm. And then if you do your maths, well, then Michael Collins' father was born in 1815 or 1816, which was just 17 years after 1798. Mm. And when Michael's father was growing up um, around uh, Woodfield, west of Clannacilty in the 1820s and 30s, well, the, the, the history of 1798 was very, very fresh. And of course, the only battle fought in Munster in 1798 was fought two miles north of Clannacilty. It was the, the Battle of the Big Cross. It was fought on the 19th of June, uh, 1798. And there was supposedly up to 120 local rebels killed in that. Mm. Now, it, it has been passed down in the Collins family that Michael's uh, grandfather's first wife died as a result of some incident involving um, red coat militias after that battle in, in 1798. Um, Michael Collins then was going to the, the local school at Lissavard from once he was about five okay. and he would cross the road in the evenings to the blacksmith's forge and there was uh, James Antry the blacksmith and uh, James was always telling the young lads how his grandfather another blacksmith had made the crappie pikes in 1798 for the battle of the big cross. Also, uh, instances the treatment of the locals by the yeomanry in 1798 when Tongalo was burned to the ground. And interestingly enough, in the Michael Collins narrative that you heard earlier of the influence of 1798, Broy, as an 11 year old, 
celebrated the centenary of 1798 in the locality. And he makes the point that his people, the people of his area, were convinced that the 98 rebellion failed for want of organization and leadership. I sat down in the valley so green, I sat down with my own true love, my sad heart torn between the two, the all love and the new, the all for her and the new that made me think of Ireland so dearly. While soft the wind blew around the glen and shook the golden barley. Oh, it is hard the woeful words to frame, to break the tie that binds us, and hard still to bear the shame of foreign chains around us. And so I said to the mountain glen, I'll seek it morning early, and join united Irishmen while soft wind shakes the barley. He knew that the British could replace the men, but they could not replace the intelligence that those men had. And it was that which changed everything going forward. According to the squad was to eliminate those. Uh, they were very careful about it because mm. it was an unpopular thing. They didn't just go out to start mowing them down. Mm. Shot one man, waited for a while to see what reaction. Would it die down? Would it get worse? Yeah. Would the British react badly and therefore lose the value of the the shooting of the sympathy. Collins always told Roy, he said, I'm a builder, not a destroyer. I will get rid of people only if they hinder my work. He sent notices to every one of the G Division detectives. If you do not stop this, you will pay the price. Several of them were chained to the railings in front of their <coughs> barracks. Several of them were beaten up. And those who didn't pay the ultimate price when Collins had many of them killed. And they gradually built up and um, they're pretty chilling, the accounts of uh, how they shot them and left them lying on the street, you know. Reporters from English and foreign newspapers thronged to Ireland and found scenes similar to occupied Belgium during the Great War. Soldiers with fixed bayonets wearing trench helmets paraded the street. A machine gun post commanded Liberty Hall. Military cordons were thrown around whole districts in Dublin while police and military carried out raids. June the 14th, Ian McPherson, Chief Secretary for Ireland, stated that the men of the RIC carried arms and maintained fortified barracks in every village and town. The force was nearly 10,000. In Turles, on the 23rd of June, there had been a day of horse racing. When the final race had finished around half four, thousands of people left the venue and walked back into town. As the crowd approached the square from U Street, a number of shots shattered the jovial atmosphere. A man had been shot twice in the back. He was District Inspector Michael Hunt of the Royal Irish Constabulary. He was dead within 20 minutes of the shooting. This is the start of what's something that's, that's new in this era of Irish history. It's you know, a targeted campaign of assassination against these detectives. So there's five of them shot in quick succession in late 1919. Collins realized early on that there were three parts of it. What was the gathering of intelligence? And then what was the analyzation of the intelligence? And the third was executing on it. And in fact, he knew that 
they had to bring about some kind of execution, and that was going to involve killing people. June 24, 24th. The Irish bishops in Maynooth stated, The British regime's use of the rule of the sword is utterly unsuited to a civilised nation. Lloyd George's private secretary, Francis Stevenson, had stated on the 29th of June that he hated returning home from the Paris Peace Conference. On the 1st of July, Michael Collins wrote to Austin Stack about his stomach trouble. He had had a stomach ulcer. July 2nd, the Times reported, the present demand of the ruling party in Ireland is a republic. On the 4th of July, Sinn Féin, the Irish Volunteers, Cumann the Man and the Gaelic League by proclamation were prohibited and suppressed throughout County Tipperary. The proclamations were issued by Lord French and the Privy Council in Ireland, signed by Sir John Robbs and General Sir Frederick Shaw, who were in Dublin Castle. A month before in June 1919, Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson has written that Ireland goes from bad to worse and a little bloodletting was needed. Thomas McDonough's brother John McDonough was a filmmaker. That was very important. He was making a movie up there, which we were brought to with music attached to it. it right. Was, it was uh, one of these silent movies. Yeah. And funny. It was all made in the St. Endes Park area. Okay. And that was how they had cameras handy to film oh. this. And it wasn't heavily publicized, you see, because it was totally illegal. Yeah. Uh, but uh, those, that wonderful footing of Arthur Griffith and others lining up with yeah. Collins taking the, the money and so on. John McDonough recalls in those dangerous and exciting times, no cinema owner would dare risk exhibiting the Republican Loans film. So, it was planned for a few volunteers in fast cars to visit certain cinemas, rush the operator's box and, at gunpoint, force the operator to take off the film he was showing and put on the loan film. And the bullet pierced my true love's side in life's young spring so early. And on my bloodstained chest she died while soft wind shakes the barley. This is a, um, a trouser belt, a braided uh, leather trouser belt that once belonged to Michael Collins. <laughs> um, it was given on loan here to our museum by um, a grand nephew of Sean Hurley. You can see up in the corner there. Look, see, the, see the signature there up in the corner in the bottom? Down, down yeah. Down under my thumb? Yeah. Do you know Michael Collins? Well, I grew up, I suppose, listening to uh, a lot of stories. 
and we always knew from that side of the family that we were related to Michael Collins yeah. but um, it was only in later years I discovered what the connection was and I suppose to make it just easy to, to, mm. to understand there's a, a the front page of a journal that we uh, published there a number of years ago it was written by my great grandmother and she mm. was Marianne McCarthy and she's pictured there uh, on the front cover now she was a, a straight second cousin of Marianne O'Brien who was okay. the mother of Michael Collins so that's our connection oh, yeah. but anyway um, we never realized until there about six or seven years ago that my great-grandmother kept a journal okay but mixed in in the list were her cousins the Collins family no they weren't okay. fam- they weren't famous back then so Michael Collins father and mother's wedding is recorded in there when Michael's mother died in 1907 her second cousin she wrote in the details there and um, then the very last entry in the journal which is quite extraordinary uh, was five lines describing the death of Michael Collins or recording the details of the death of Michael Collins in 1922. Mm. So I eventually tracked down a distant relative who told me the story that one night this lady was um, in her farmhouse, it was during the, the Civil War sometime mm. after the death of Michael Collins, uh, at a place called Art Kit near Inneskeen, north of Clonakilty. Anti-treaty IRA came into her kitchen and they were demanding a horse from the stable. She was from the Collins side of the Civil War divide and she refused to give them the horse. Mm. So there was an argument ensued and one of the IRA pulled out a revolver and fired a shot up through the ceiling of the kitchen. Upstairs was her daughter Elizabeth's bedroom and Marianne was in her late 60s at the time. She just thought that her daughter had been shot upstairs. But anyway, she was never the same again and her daughter Molly, who pictured at this side, mm. would later write, as a result of the shooting, my mother lost her mind. And that's why this journal ended with the, the lines uh, recording the death of Michael Collins, which was kind of amazing, really. Walter Long was arguing for a reform of the RIC. Lord French has written that he liked Walter Long's idea to employ some discharged soldiers in the RIC. Already proposals were being drawn for transforming the RIC into what would become the infamous Black and Tans. 12,000 people crammed into Madison Square Garden in New York to hear De Valera's first public speech. Another 6,000 are locked out as conditions would not be safe due to the excitement and popularity De Valera was drawing in. The crowd had roared for 15 minutes without a break upon De Valera's introduction. De Valera began by saying, this is New York's recognition of the Irish Republic. He criticized President Wilson and his lack of recognition of Ireland. On July 12th, a key date in the Unionist calendar, Sir Edward Carson opened his Repeal the Home Rule Act at a demonstration of Belfast Orange Men, which took place at Ballymanock near Hollywood. Carson had threatened to once more call out the Ulster Volunteers if an attempt was made to take away their rights as British citizens. He wished to fight the notion of Irish self-government tooth and nail regardless of its advantages and regardless of any evil that might follow the complete shelving of it. He had stated that Mr De Valera was working against you in America with the help of the Catholic hierarchy in that country. Sir Edward Carson threatened if any attempt were made to change the status of Ulster he would summon the Ulster Provisional Government and call out the Ulster Volunteers. And that De Valera imagined in his vanity that one day or the other he's going to march through Belfast and Ulster and you will all willingly take off your hats and bow the knee to the head of the organisation, which in the darkest hours of the war for the world's freedom shot His Majesty's soldiers in the streets of Dublin. He knew that this was going to cause a problem. He did not do this without thinking a great deal about it. 
and he brought in several young men and asked them, along with others, along with Dick McKee and Richard Mokahe, would you be willing simply to shoot people, uh, not in a situation of a, of, a, of, a, of a fixed battle, but it, it just to assassinate them? Some of the men who agreed to carry out these shootings were Tom Kyo, Tom Kilcoyne, Joe Leonard, and Jim Slattery. Jim Slattery has written, Dick McKee addressed those of us who had been selected and asked if we had any objection to shooting enemy agents. The greater number of volunteers objected for one reason or another. When I was asked the question, I said I was prepared to obey orders. Well, the squad was an initiative of Michael Collins. Um, one version by Ned Broy, who was, one of, who was a DMP detective himself, was that he came up with the idea. Um, but it probably was an idea of Collins himself and also Dick McKee, who at the time was the head of the Dublin Brigade of the Volunteers. And most of the young men said no. Okay. That they felt that this was against their uh, morals or against their religion, and they said no. So it was very uh, ruthless, the whole um, idea behind the, 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 the campaign, but hugely effective as well. Dick McKee presided over the first meeting of the squad, and he'd assembled men from the 2nd Battalion, which is the north inner city of the Dublin Brigade of the IRA. Uh, initially, six men were, were recruited into the squad, um, the, and this is the, the active service unit part. Um, initially, the head was Mick McDonald. On July 13th, De Valera made an appearance in Cubs Park, Chicago. 25,000 people showed up to hear De Valera. He received a 31 minute ovation when he took to the podium. July 17th, General Jan Christian Smuts Peace Conference, Paris. He believed the most pressing of all constitutional problems is the Irish question. It has become a chronic wound. De Valera toured the United States from the east to the west. At every town where he was to speak, he was met by a large procession which escorted him to the official reception. He was given the freedom of Butte and Montana. In Dublin, a victory march to remember World War I was to take place across the city. The Victory Day, otherwise known as Peace Day, had been celebrated across the British Empire. One of the largest parades in the Empire took place in Dublin, where 15,000 regular soldiers with artillery, armoured cars, light and heavy tanks, paraded alongside 5,000 demobilized troops. The Lord Lieutenant, Lord French, had taken a salute of the troops at the Bank of Ireland on College Green, and a large platform was erected to accommodate his staff and a number of government officials.
On July 21st, Lloyd George had made a statement saying that he was trying to apply the principle of self-determination to Ireland, but that Irish men could not agree among themselves. He told the House of Commons that Ireland was not a nation, and if nationalist Ireland was entitled to self-determination, the Protestant people of North East Ulster had an equal right to it. The Nationalist MP for North East Tyrone had stated that the coercion of Tyrone into Ulster will be one of the most difficult propositions any government has yet set before it. General Jan Christian Smuts, before leaving for South Africa, stated that the Irish question had become a chronic wound and that the septic effects of which were spreading to the whole British system and as a result of the influence of America it was now starting to poison Britain's foreign relations. Unless the Irish question is settled on the great principles which form the basis of this empire, Smuts had stated, this empire would cease to exist. The Australian Senate is to be asked to vote on a resolution urging the immediate granting of full self-government, preferably on Dominion lines. On July 27th, the Sunday Independent published a cartoon on its front page featuring Prime Minister Lloyd George and the leading voice of unionism Edward Carson singing from the same hymn sheet a song on the unintended dismemberment of the Union. It was obvious to Collins that moral tactics weren't going to work. Ned Broy in his witness statement told Michael Collins that the Irish were a movement of young idealists exposed in conflict with a cold-blooded serpentine organisation, the British government in Ireland. A ruthless war was to be made on the hardcore. In the case of any G-man who remained hostile, a warning was to be given to him, such as tying him to a railing before any attack was made on him. They were f the DMP men got fair warning. Mm. You know. Okay. And when, when what's that? Like they were they were given warning as in to stop uh, yeah, investigating. Yeah, or? just don't, just don't. Mm. You know. Okay. They had roughed them up, intimidated them, but it didn't work. Mm. and a certain number of the G Division were determined to pursue their operations. I mean, in a, in a way, you have to admire them for being the professional policemen that they were, mm. you know. Um, so Collins ordered a special duties unit under MacDonald mm. uh, to kill uh, the dog Smith, mm. Patrick Smith. That was the nickname he was given. Yeah, yeah. that was the nickname he was given, yeah. Probably because he was so determined, mm. so dogged in that sense. Yeah. Uh, Michael Collins had been authorised by Richard Mulcahy, Chief of Staff, and Cahill Brewer, Minister for Defence, to kill Detective Sergeant Patrick Smith. Reasons for the shooting were because Smith had arrested Pierce Beasley, who was carrying many incriminating documents. Collins had sent word to Smith not to testify, but Smith ignored the warning. He's quoted as saying, I'm not going to let any young scuts tell me how to do my duty. Beasley was sentenced to two years in jail instead of the two months he had expected. So they waited for him a number of nights out uh, where he lived out in Drumcondra. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd arrive home on a late tram around 11 o'clock, last tram. Mm -hmm. um, and they took Kennedy with them, who was an intelligence officer who could identify him. Okay. So it sets up the early kind of, if you like, methodology. They have someone who can identify the target. Mm -hmm. um, and then the squad, once identified, the squad or the special duties unit, as it's called at this time, move in and, and kill the, the intended target or victim. Okay. Uh, it wasn't a happy decision, you know, to send these young fellas out. Uh, he didn't take any pleasure or pride in it, but he had to do it. Yeah. And uh, it was them or us, really them or us situation. 
they, you know, they had a landslide victory in the election, so they had been given a mandate to, to, to go and do what they said they were going to do. They set up the alternative government on the 21st of January, and Smith was one of several detectives who came at them hammer and tongs. He was an enemy of the state, in, in, in effect, and he was coming at the state. They had set up the Irish Republic as a separate state. He now represented what they saw as a foreign occupying power. In 1919, you had an Irish government in exile within its own country. The members of the squad who carried out that shooting were Jim Slattery, Tom Kyo, Tom Ennis, and Mick Kennedy. So this was where they started shooting. Yeah. And this was where the first detective in Dublin during the War of Independence was taken out. So shooting would have started here, but Smith, uh, he was, you know, they were using these uh, 38 calibers, the, the pistols. They didn't do it as much damage as, as they wanted them to do. Uh, Smith was able to take it, so he struggled away. He ran. He ran towards his house, which was number 50. Now, Smith himself was 51 years old. So there would have been a sort of a, you know, a, a really chaotic scramble here. There was about a dozen of these 38 calibre bullets were fired. Um, two of his sons, one of them was a teenager, came out and, and tried to help him. A uh, six-year-old son came out and, and you know, saying that he wanted to get the men who'd shot Dada. It was the last time that they used 38 calibre bullets. They wanted to make sure that that wasn't going, going to happen again. So for the rest of the operations that they conducted in 1919 and beyond, they made sure that they used 0.45 calibre bullets. Um, he doesn't actually die until September mm. and uh, basically the response from Collins um, is you made a right bags out of that job mm. you know so there's a debate about the effectiveness of the weapons that they're using mm. and that's when they switch to 45s okay. uh, 45 being a 45 calibre bullet mm. which has much greater stopping power. I was asked the question why did Michael Collins ask the squad to stop using the 38 pistol and start using the 45 pistol? The answer is not in the guns themselves, the answer is in the ammunition. The 38 that they had been using had a 175 to 200 grain bullet. It went downrange at 620 feet per second and had 175 foot pounds of energy transfer. The 45 caliber bullet, however, had a 230 grain bullet, traveled at 830 feet per second, and had an energy transfer of 356 foot pounds, twice that of the 38. Therefore, the 45 caliber bullet was a man stopper. It put people on the ground. The 38 did not. That's the reason for the change. The Colt 1911. The 45 ACP round that this gun uses has a 230 grain bullet that moves at 820 feet per second, and it is definitely a man stop. When Colin sent his men out to do it, his intent was to have the man executed, but immediately to back off and to see what the reaction was going to be, because he did not know what it was going to be. But in almost all guerrilla actions, what you do is you start out with a very small minority in favor of your thing, a very small minority against, and a very large majority of people who are either neutral or just don't know. The guerrilla war here, the successful <coughs> guerrilla wars, will transfer that allegiance from neutrality to your side, and that's what they did. On the 30th of July, the Cork Examiner is the first Irish newspaper to publish photos of De Valera's mass meeting in Fenway Park in Boston a few weeks before. The photos by the Boston Post are highly significant, as they show Sinn Féin's support in America for the Irish cause. And on the 30th of July, in Helena, Montana, De Valera made a rousing speech and said that since the US has gained independence, there has been five revolutions in Ireland. And should they not receive independence soon, there will be another. On the 1st of August 1919, Michael Collins met with Terence McSweeney and Liam DC, who were representatives of the Cork Brigade. 
Also present at the meeting were Richard Mulcahy, Pater Clancy and Dick McKee. The progress of the war in Cork was discussed, as well as the need for more guerrilla actions in the countryside. When he returned, Collins recommended to brigades everywhere to set up similar training camps. In August 1919, police barracks were attacked by parties of volunteers who, when the garrison surrendered, bound their prisoners and seized the military stores. In Ennistymon, County Clare, a 15-year-old named Francis Murphy was shot dead at his home on the night of the 13th of August. The blame was directed towards the British military. Murphy's funeral took place and a procession a mile long which comprised of motor cars, men on horseback, boys wearing mourning badges accompanied his body to the family burial ground. In Clare, Sinn Féin, the Gaelic League, the Irish Volunteers and Common the Man had been proclaimed as dangerous and suppressed. The Chief Secretary E. McPherson issued a memorandum. Uh, a general headquarters um, mainly run by Lee Tobin. Every company of the IRA had to have an intelligence officer. They reported then to uh, an intelligence officer of the brigade who, who reported back to, um, to GHQ. And this is uh, Joseph Byrne, August 1919, RIC Inspector General. In large area, the police, without the assistance of troops, would be totally unable to maintain any semblance of order. London Daily News in August 1919 said, Both the official Sinn Féin party and the unofficial groups of gunmen have their spy service in the very heart of the government machine. The old position, where there was always a traitor among the Irish revolutionaries, has been completely reversed. The conspiracies are now well informed and the government mostly in the dark. Michael Collins had presided at that meeting. That was the last time, though, he would visit that particular brigade until mid-1921. August 18th. The Times reported the hope that an army of military force might cow the Irish has plainly miscarried. On the 20th of August, in a private session, some volunteers took an oath of allegiance to the Dáil. The oath was moved by Cahill Brewer and seconded by Terence McSweeney. In two or three months, all deputies and officials had taken the oath of allegiance. Okay, so Cahill Brewer wanted an oath taken by volunteers. Why was this? Okay, so Cahill Brewer is the Minister for Defence of the First Dáil. Yeah. You know, and Cahill Brewer's conception of the movement is Irish independence has been declared. Yeah. By a, following a vote of the Irish people in the election of 1918. Um, now, as against that, the way Carl Brewer sees it is people like, particularly Michael Collins, as director of intelligence, and to a degree Richard Mulcahy, who becomes the chief of staff of the volunteers, mm. are amassing a kind of a personal power mm. over the army. How much control did the IRB had at this point? Uh, when the IRB was reorganized, after this the rising, they was controlled by a number of men who are much younger. Michael Collins, for example, and Dennis McCullough and Thomas Ash and Harry Boland. They were much younger and less concerned with the social aspect of the IRB and became more a tool to appoint officers and uh, uh, choose people. So the IRB at, at the time had control in the sense that they controlled pretty much the choice of officers. After 1916, Cahill Brewer had quit the IRB. Cahill Brewer had long resented the power that Michael Collins had over defence matters. 
Michael Collins' positions as IRA Adjutant General and Director of Intelligence meant his activities strayed into many areas Cahill considered his domain. Um, and Cahill Brewer is very keen on the idea that the volunteers or the IRA would be the army of the Irish Republic, so they would be responsible to the government uh, declared by the Dáil in January 1919. So the oath taken to the Irish Republic is very much this idea of the volunteers are answerable to the elected government of the Irish people. Collins is also a more kind of clandestine idea, a more IRB idea of the way this will work, where it's okay to have like a secret leadership, it's all right, it's okay to have networks where you organize things through secret societies and so on, uh, which the likes of Brew, although he had been an IRB member, is against. You know, that, that sounds very much like it's the treaty split, you know, mm. prefigured. But I mean, even guys like Todd Andrews, for example, who was an anti-treatyite in the, the treaty split, mm. said, you know, there was no need for the army to take an oath to the to the dull. You know, this is just window dressing. Yeah. The last in stack was a member of the IRB. So you have to judge all these guys yeah. that they're this substratum of uh, Carla Brewer wasn't in the IRB. Dev wasn't in the IRB. Yeah. You know, uh, some of the agitation at Collins was here he is strutting around running the Irish volunteers that became the IRA after the yeah. 20th of August 1919 they're saying Collins is trying to run everything so the element of jealousy and Collins says well feck you Cahill or yeah. uh, you know he's in at a, a Gaelic league meeting yeah. and Collins is making a sort of a skit of you know ma Tashe Mahogany gas pipe or something I'm not saying yeah, it was yeah. something like yeah, that yeah, yeah. and some of the uh, Irish uh, literati are saying that's mocking the Irish language. You know, you, you've that cultural. Yeah. He was an action man, so uh, he's become well known through the Ben and Aids Society. Uh, you know, being secretary of it. His IRB men are there. They're all looking to the main chance. Tom Clark was their pin-up, and you know these guys, the the old Fenian tradition of you know. Clark being in jail for 14 years, you know, in a, in a solitary confinement and everything. All of those would have been inspiring him on a little thing. And he, he obviously had decided, because that was the IRB, uh, you know, that was the old Fenian thing. Mm. We have to we have to fight them, we cannot talk to them. From then on, the Irish volunteers are called the Irish Republican Army, yes. you see. That's where the IRA comes in, in this genesis. So you, you had, uh, and that suited uh, Dev in America in terms of his presentation you know to the ancient order Hibernians or wherever he was going. Yeah. Michael Collins and the IRB opposed this oath as they still viewed the doll as a vehicle that moderates would use to sell out the independence movement. Michael Collins wrote De Valera the volunteer affair is fixed but the IRB remained independent. Another question to ask is uh, the guerrilla war, uh, was it controlled and managed from Dublin's general headquarters or was it more uh, spread out throughout the country? Well, general headquarters tried. One of the things that makes successful guerrilla wars is you must have uh, some kind of connection to a legitimate government. And that's one of the things that the uh, GHQ here in Dublin tried. It was, there was a meeting in August of 1919, after the war had started, but before it really got going, in which the individuals, particularly from Munster, down, down in Cork, were asked to come up here. Uh, Liam D.C., Liam Lynch, uh, uh, Florio Donahue, the other leaders who, who were very, very successful then and became very successful. <coughs> and there was a meeting here to go over the strategy. And Richard Mulcahy said that the strategy they were going to use was guerrilla warfare, but whenever there was going to be an ambush, the first thing they had to do was to let the British know that they had a chance to surrender. The commanders in the field were astounded at it, that how can you possibly ask us to do this? And Mulcahy and Brewer pressed very hard, but Collins and the, the commanders finally convinced the rest of the general headquarters that would never work. So the command structure was there, it was structured, but it never really had a great effect throughout the country. August 20th, Land Bank. Robert Barton, Minister for Agriculture submitted a scheme for a land bank to help Irish agriculture. People could borrow three quarters of the price of the land to be purchased. Dáil Éireann guaranteed the bank a loan of £250,000. 
the doll had publicly announced that they had sanctioned a national loan of £250,000 to be raised in Ireland and $5 million in America. In August, there were 11 attacks on police. The RIC's Inspector General felt that a deliberate campaign was being made to break the morale of the force. Paddy O'Daly is released in August mm -hmm. with Joe Leonard. Okay. And as soon as they're out, um, they're called to an interview with Michael Collins. Okay. And he asks him to set up a special duties unit mm. to for to carry out assassinations. Mm. And this is the second such special duties unit. Okay. Um, from B Company, yeah. Second Battalion. Um, Mick McDonald's is uh, E Company, Second mm. Battalion. Okay. So. Uh, the two units operate independently. According to Paddy O'Daly's witness statement, he had made contact with Brian Holohan. Brian Holohan was employed by the British military for catering purposes, and he was superintendent of the officers' houses in the Dublin barracks. Paddy Daly has said about August 1919, Brian Holohan came to him and told him he could get 145 Colt automatics and 2,000 rounds of ammunition for 100 pounds. The guns would be handed over in sacks across the railway wall at John's Road at the Kingsbridge End. Brian Holohan and Paddy Daly were haggling with a British soldier over the price of the weapons. Daly has said that altogether we got 100 guns and approximately 5,000 rounds of ammunition and I think it was £90 we paid for the lot. Paddy Daly has also said in his witness statement that shortly afterwards a supply of Peter de Painter guns came in through headquarters. The C96 Mauser, also known as Peter the Painter, uh, is one of the best weapons that was used by the ASU and, and the squad. It fires a 7.63 by 25 cartridge. It's a bottleneck cartridge, which allows it to have a very high muzzle velocity. In fact, this was the most powerful handgun until 1935. De Valera had arrived in New York with the intention of starting an intensive drive for the Dahl Aaron loan. He was confronted by opposition from the FOIF, the Friends of Irish Freedom, led by Judge Cahillan and John Devoy. The judge declared it impracticable, but Joseph McGarrity and others from the FOIF supported De Valera and they made $100,000 available to organize the collection. The appeal was for $10 million. Frank P. Walsh, chairman of the American Commission on Irish Independence, opened headquarters in New York on August 23rd. On the 28th of August, 1919, the amount of national doll loan issued reached £250,000. Around this period, by letter, Michael Collins and De Valera would have disagreements over honouring the 1866 Fenian bonds. Despite this, Collins still found time, and at great risk, to visit Sinead De Valera and her children. He was fully aware that his children used to call Michael, Uncle Michael. He was very aware that when he was in America, Collins used to go down to Greystones. Your sister Deirdre says yes. that uh, De Valera's own wife uh, wouldn't appear in public photographs for 15 years because of what happened to Michael Collins. came through Michael Collins, to the degree that if anyone else wanted to get their own weapons and had the money to go to Britain and buy the weapons, Collins would say you can't do that because you'll ruin my market. Arms smuggling. 
1919, much of the arm, arm smuggling to Ireland was made to Liverpool when they had a man named Newcare. Newcare was a dock worker uh, to Cunard Line. So it was a big uh, ship line making the, tra the, the, the routes from Liverpool to the United States mainly uh, and to Ireland. Newcare was able to smuggle guns and war materials and explosives and even people through a, a network of friendly sailors and dock workers who would bring the, the, the things to the, the ships and bring them to Ireland, mostly for Dublin, but also to Belfast. Commandant Patrick G. Daly, witness statement 814. The Liverpool docks extended seven miles along the Merseyside. The dockland was separated from the city by a high wall. Entrance to the dock was by a gateway at which a policeman was always on guard. To carry arms into a boat, it was necessary to put them into a sailor's packing bag with old clothes. The bag was carried on one's shoulder, giving the policeman on duty the impression that the person carrying it was a sailor about to join his ship. Sometimes rifles, and in most cases, it was the British Lee Enfield rifle, had the stock screwed from the barrel. The barrels were slung across the bearer's neck by a stout cord and the stock was placed in the pockets of one's coat. The barrels were well concealed by the carrier wearing a large overcoat. During my term of office, a dispatch from Dublin to Liverpool always from Michael Collins with the well-known signature MOC had on the envelope a capital letter LP which meant Liverpool. And in 1919 uh, Harry Bolland was in the United States and one of his several tasks he had a uh, task of helping the Valera he was has the task of running the the, the dial bonds but he also has the task uh, to help smuggling arms from the United States to Liverpool and from Liverpool, Newcare would put them in a ship to Ireland. This was the main uh, hub of smuggling guns. The number one Mark III short magazine, Lee Enfield. The Lee Enfield carbine number one, RIC. And the Winchester 97 shotgun. The most common rifle during the period is the number one Mark III short magazine Lee Enfield. It had a 10 round box magazine, five round charging clips were placed in the yoke on the top and pressed down into the magazine. Two chargings and you had a full 10 round magazine. It's a very accurate rifle. It is also very, very fast. There is the story of a Sergeant Snoxall of the British Army who was able to fire 38 well-placed shots at 300 yards in one minute. This is what everyone wants who's fighting at a distance. Not in the streets of Dublin where the handgun is, is of more use, but in Cork or Galway or uh, Kerry, this is the weapon that you want. On the 2nd of September 1919, in Lorha, Tipperary, seven Lorha IRA volunteers under the command of Felix Cronin ambushed an RIC patrol with three officers being attacked. Sergeant Philip Brady was shot and died instantly. The 48-year-old had only arrived in Lorha four days ago. Incidentally, Felix Cronin was to marry Kitty Kiernan after Michael Collins' death. John O'Sheehan from Roscommon was jailed for two years for singing The Felons of Our Land. The Fermoy attack 
had been submitted for GHQ approval by Liam Lynch and the Fermoy Battalion Commander George Power. The fact that this ambush was to be carried out without loss of life would show that GHQ was very anxious about the public reaction to violence. 7th of September, Cork. Liam Lynch, Commandant of Cork No. 2 Brigade, attacked a British military party going to church in Fermoy. At about half ten that morning, a group of 15 soldiers from the 2nd Battalion, King Shropshire Light Infantry, marched to the Wesleyan Church in Fermoy. They were rushed by a group of IRA who only had six revolvers between them and wooden cudgels. Involved in this IRA operation were 23 men of Cork's 2nd Brigade, including Michael Fitzgerald. The British refused to surrender. Shots were fired and four fell to the ground. Michael Mansfield has said that badly needed rifles and equipment were captured and taken quickly away. As well as Michael Mansfield, another Waterford OC in action was George Lennon. Liam Lynch was wounded in the altercation and was taken to Yall where he was attended to. As the IRA escaped, fell trees were placed on the road. of September. British retaliation. 200 British regulars sacked and looted shops causing £3,000 worth of damage. They were not checked by the British government. Although he was mortally wounded, he lived for five weeks before finally dying of an abscess of the lung caused by his wounds. Detective Smith was a married man and a father of seven. As a result of Smith's shooting, Dublin Castle had banned Sinn Féin. Collins had used this to outmaneuver the more moderate Sinn Féin members. In other words, they would not have the ability to temper or to heal the more aggressive tactics that Collins had favoured. This campaign of assassination is a reactive thing. It's the, so you have mass arrests followed by assassinations, um, followed by the British suppression of the Dáil, mm. followed by kind of all our guerrilla warfare. This gave huge impetus to the Irish campaign in the United States. De Valera explained to the Americans that the Irish people were being denied a government of their own choice by a violent military regime. The Gaelic League, Cumann Amman and Dáil Éireann were also banned. Sir Warren Fisher, head of the British Civil Service, concluded that Dublin Castle was almost woodenly stupid. He stated, imagine the result on public opinion in Great Britain of a similar act. 12th of September, the Dublin Metropolitan Police raided the Sinn Féin headquarters at number 6 Harcourt Street. At about 10.30 a.m. on the 12th of September 1919, uh, here at number 6 Harcourt Street, it, it was raided. According to Evelyn Lawless's witness statement, 414, while we were in number 6, the police and military made a raid on the premises, looking, I suppose, for wanted men. We had no warning of the raid at all. There was two lorry loads of British soldiers. The raid itself was led by Detective Hoey, who was later shot that evening. Ginger O'Connell had come in to see Mick, and as he left the room, he forgot to close the door, which Mick remarked on sarcastically. I was getting up to shut it when I saw a policeman standing guard outside. I shut the door and told Mick it looked like a raid. I stuck Mick's revolver down my stocking and anything else incriminating the girls took care of. When they got inside, um, Collins 
he exclaimed were caught like rats in a trap because they tried to get out the back and they couldn't. When the police arrived, we disposed of everything. They searched the men, but not us. Read what's in that. Right there, now. Read it. Read it, Read it yourself. There was no means of escape as the military had occupied the narrow entrance in the back as well as the front. He remained seated at his desk, quite calm and collected. Inspector McFeely came to our rooms, looked a little bit frightened and went round searching a different desk. So Collins positioned himself in one of the upstairs rooms and he em employed the tactic that was to prove so useful to him over the course of the next couple of years. Um, he didn't act like he was guilty. Mick sat very casually on his desk with one leg swinging and was scathing in his remarks. Um, one of the detectives who was participating in the raid, he was known to be sympathetic towards the home rule cause. So Collins simply sat down at a desk looking like a clerk and when this detective came in, he turned on him. What sort of legacy will you leave to your family? Looking for blood money? Could you not find some honest work to do? Collins was using Broy's suggested ploy to confront McFeely, a staunch home ruler. McFeely did not know Collins and surmised that Collins could not be of much importance if he was working upstairs with the women. They cleared off finally taking two prisoners with them. So was two men were arrested. Uh, one, of, one of them was er Ernie Bloyd. Yeah. Mick came down, sat at his desk and refused to leave. We all remained at our work until the normal time for our departure. Mick's coolness saved him from being recognised. Collins has written, it was only by a miracle I was not landed. Inspector Kerr told Ned Broy afterwards, McFeely says there is going to be serious trouble. He has met a very determined young man, a clerk in number 6 Harcourt Street. And if they are all as extreme as he is, there is plenty of trouble coming. And if the clerks are, are, are men of that sort of calibre that, that they give me that, that sort of an earful, you know, when we go up against the big guns, we're gonna have a, you know, our work cut out for us. Why did the squad want Howie taken, taken out? Uh, Daniel Howie was working with the G-men before this terrorizing. Uh, during the terrorizing, uh, Sean McDermott almost escaped. He was almost sent to Frongo, actually because he, they failed to recognize John McDermott as Sean McDermott. But when they were about to embark, uh, Daniel Howey went to, to the groups of men who were about to embark, and he recognized Sean McDermott. And Colin didn't forgive him that. There was a great deal of animus against these guys because they had actually um, picked out the, the signatories, the leaders of the 1916 rebellion for execution. Um, after 1916, he was particularly aggressive in his pursuit of Sean McDermott up in Richmond Barracks. Uh, he testified against McDermott in, in, in his court martial, which ultimately led to McDermott being executed. Well, it, it was more of the um, decided Michael Collins policy. Mm. Um, you know, they'd identified who were the central, what they call the hardcore of the G Division, the people who wouldn't give up tracking them. He was a very, very energetic police detective. 12 September in 1990, he was involved in the raid in the Sinfen headquarters. Uh, but Daniel Hoey was around and he recognized other people. He arrested other people who were in Sinfen headquarters. On the 12th of September, according to Jim Slattery's witness statement, number 445, Mick McDonald had said, they very nearly got the man we want to guard. They nearly got him today. That was the first inkling I got that Collins was at the heart of things. That evening, uh, then Howie was returning to the G Division. Tom Ennis, Mick McDonald, and Jim Slattery went to Townsend Street. And he was, he went to enter a, a shop to, to get, get a glass of milk. They passed by Detective Howie when he was looking at a window. McDonald said, it is Hoey all right. So here, just at, at Brunswick Street, uh, at, at the Central Police Station, this is where the 31-year-old detective Daniel Hoey, he was from Offaly. Now, he was shot just at the entrance there by three squad members on, on the night of the 12th of September. We cross over to the side of the street, which was at the back of the barracks, and we shot him at the door of the garage. Now, he was shot several times. Um, he died shortly afterwards up in the Mercer Hospital, just off St. Stephen's Green. McDonald said, We had better go to Michael Collins direct that Hoey had been shot that night and report to him. 
uh, Collins controlled what they were doing. In other words, they didn't go off and say, there's mm. a, a, a DMP man, let's shoot him. Mm. What it really is, is it's a concerted campaign against the G Division okay. to try to decapitate it. Later in 1922, Michael Collins wrote in the New York American, without her spies, England was helpless. Only the armed forces and the spies and the criminal agents of the British government were attacked. Kathleen McKenna has recalled an occasion during a discussion on spies when a young lady who was hoping to please Michael Collins exclaimed, of course every spy should be shot. Michael Collins angrily turned on her and gave his emphatic view of the conditions of judgment and punishment. 17th of September, American Reaction. An outraged America held a meeting of protest at this news in the Lexington Avenue Theatre, New York. The crowd was so large it spilled onto the streets outside. Dahl Aaron was declared a dangerous association and prohibited by the British executive in Ireland. This gave huge impetus to the Irish campaign in the United States. De Valera explained to the Americans that the Irish people were being denied a government of their own choice by a violent military regime. Uh, why was the Irish government suppressed? Right. The short answer to why the, the, the first dawn on the Irish government was, was suppressed is because Collins embarked on this campaign of assassinating detectives. So, and the British, I don't think, understand what they're dealing with yet in terms of this new generation of, of Irish revolutionaries. They tend to think of Sinn Féin as like the IPP you know, plus one. They think, okay, well, you know, the, the Home Rule Party was militant in its day as well in the days of Parnell. Um, you know, they used agrarian outrage, as they called it, and so forth, and they, a lot of them were, were also Fenians. And in the end, they went to Westminster and they learned to play the game there. And the, the British say about Sinn Féin is that, you know, Sinn Féin are, ta are doing this thing about talking about an Irish Republic and so on. But in the end, they'll take their salaries and they'll go to Westminster. Yeah. Then Sinn Féin will come and they'll be the new IPP. They'll be the new Home Rule Party. Mm. We can do business with them. Um, so the British um, are a little bit shocked by the by the renewal of violence in a way, you mm. know, in this kind of very targeted way. So they suppressed the doll, which they hadn't they had been delaying doing. But the British at the time still don't have a very clear policy on how they're going to settle what they call the Irish question. Mm. So. You're supposed to have had Home Rule back in 1912. Now that didn't happen because of Union supposition and because of the First World War. But post the First World War, their their policy, they don't seem to have a policy. They seem to have let it drift. Sir John French, who is the Lord Lieutenant, uh, but he's a hardline unionist. Mm. He believes this, that maybe we should let this Home Rule thing die. After the 12th of September, when Dáil Éireann was proclaimed illegal, Boner Law had written in response to the King, the policy of His Majesty's government must be what it has seen throughout, supporting the Irish government in taking whatever measures they think necessary to secure orderly government in Ireland. Um, on the other hand, Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, is still wants to get home rule in some sort of form, probably in partition form though. Hmm. Patrick O'Daly's witness statement has stated that Dick McKee told Joe Leonard and myself to report to number 46 Parnell Street. We met Michael Collins and Richard Mulcahy at the meeting. They told us it was proposed to form a squad. The squad would take orders directly from Michael Collins and in the absence of Collins, the orders would be given to us either through Dick McKee or Richard Mulcahy. Collins told us that we were being formed to deal with spies and informers and that he had authority from the government to have this matter carried out. Collins said that any of us who had read Irish history would know that no organisation in the past had an intelligence system through which spies and informers could be dealt with, but that now that position was going to be rectified by the formation of an intelligence branch. He went on to say that under no circumstances whatever were we to take it on ourselves to shoot anybody, even if we knew he was a spy, unless we had to do it in self-defence while on active service. He told us to remember that all members of G Division and the police were not our enemies and that indiscriminate shootings might result in the death of friends. Collins only picked four of us for the squad that night. Joe Leonard, Sean Doyle, Ben Barrett, 
and myself in charge. He told the four of us that we were to leave our employment and that we would be compensated for loss of work. We were to have a fixed point where we could be mobilised and I gave him number 10 Vesper Avenue North Strand. We had a list of enemy agents who were to be eliminated. 20th of September. Irish papers silenced. All Republican papers were suppressed. 23rd of September 1919. Lloyd George had argued with Lord French in Downing Street that Ireland's three southern provinces should be together under one parliament. 24th of September. Walter Long's memorandum to Lloyd George had recommended that the government of Ireland, in other words Dublin Castle, shall be given in public the assurance of the entire confidence and support of His Majesty's government, who are determined that treason, crime and outrage shall not be allowed to continue, and two, that on the adoption of the federal scheme for the United Kingdom, Ireland shall receive such parliaments as may be thought necessary. Obviously there must be two one for Ulster and another for the three southern provinces. 25th of September, Lord French had called Henry Wilson and told him that the Prime Minister had agreed to accept the freedom of Belfast. Henry Wilson was delighted. P. O'Keefe, member of Dáil for North Cork, was jailed for two years for a seditious speech. Members of the West Cork IRA attacked two RIC constables as they were leaving Sunday Mass, as they wished to disarm them. One of the RIC constables is shot three times. By the 30th of September, 5,588 private homes had been raided. London newspapers are reporting the British Cabinet is finalising the wording of a new Home Rule Bill for Ireland and that the difference between this bill and the old Home Rule Bill was that the island of Ireland was to be partitioned. I was approached by Dick McKee and asked to make myself available to go to London for special duty with the object of looking the situation over in London and coming back and reporting as to the possibility of wiping out the British cabinet and several other prominent people including editors of newspapers etc who were antagonistic to this country. Our chief job in London was to familiarise ourselves with the then ministers of the British cabinet, their haunts and habits etc. We were to attend any meetings or functions which they were to attend. We were to get any information we could about the geography of Whitehall especially number 10 Downing Street. I could not report favourably. Michael Collins, who had lived in London, knew the situation existing there, agreed with this report. But Cahill Brewer insisted that it could and should be done. He had already led a similar team to London to kill cabinet members in the House of Commons in 1918 if they had introduced conscription in Ireland. Mulcahy regarded Cahill Brewer as brave and brainless as a bull. Men of war, if you like, people who become leaders in war are very different to the type of leaders that we have in peacetime. Mm. Um, and they need people who are decisive, who have a courage to act uh, and make very difficult decisions. And Sean Tracy is certainly one of those. Mm. Um, he's taken the action at Salahed Beg. Mm. He hasn't done a runner to the United States or mm. been persuaded to leave the country. Mm. He comes to Dublin to support... Uh, Michael Collins' uh, special duties units, the mm. precursor to the squad.
I remember well my father tell me stories of before Of the risings and rebellions Fitzgeralds and Wolton The land wars and the slum lords Imperial penal law How a million died of hunger From the great ungodly mall My father died an old man When I was just a boy And he says to me now Michael Oh, right before he died One day you'll be a great man With a hunger in your heart You'll do great things for Ireland Oh, you'll try and win her back Oh, my name is Michael Collins From the rebel county Cork Where I learned an Irish vocation to stand up and to talk I came so to toe with an empire and a pen in my hand